Welcome to episode 29 of the This Is Horror podcast. I'm your host, Michael Wilson, and today we're going to be interviewing Stephen Graham Jones, and we're going to be talking a little bit about his short story, 13, which he very kindly narrated for us in episode 28. So I don't really think that Stephen Graham Jones needs much of an introduction to our regular listeners. He has penned numerous stories, including published by This Is Horror, the novella The Elvis Room, as per Stephen's biography on his website. He is the author of 15 and a half novels, six collections and more than 200 stories. So, with that said, I'm just going to jump straight into the recording with Stephen. Enjoy. And now for a horror interview. So, Stephen, to start off with, if you could tell us a little bit about the genesis of 13. Well, Paula Garan, the editor, got a hold of me, and she had an anthology coming together about Halloween. She asked if I had anything to contribute, and I said, I bet I could. And then, of course, I put it off and put it off like I always do, and I have a deadline. And then I had two or three weeks to do it, and so I sat down. I thought, Halloween, you know, what, what can I do about Halloween? Because I don't know nothing about the history of it or any of that, so I knew I was going to like draw on my own experiences. And so I thought about my most, like, um, I don't know, my most pungent memory of Halloween, I guess you could say. And that was probably when I was about 12 or 13 myself. And I lived in Stanton, Texas. And I remember running, we'd run around the convent, um, the convent grounds. The convent was all shut off. But um, we'd run around the convent grounds. And this one guy, Corey Hopper, he was a uh, grade or two above me. He was hiding behind a, a headstone, one that was kind of tilted over. And as I was running by, he jumped up and did his arms all big. And he was about 6'5 at the time, probably, and scared me senseless, you know. And um, it really stuck with me forever. And um, so that, that that's really where it, where it comes from, I guess, for me. And also, well, it comes from another town I grew up in, Midland, Texas, which is only 20 miles away from Stanton. Had used to have a Big Chief Theater, it was called. And there was always the legend around town that some kid had got castrated there maybe it really happened i don't know but we all were really spooked by that place growing up and it's fine i went back recently and it's torn down now and it's probably for the best so it sounds like um there's quite a lot of almost non-fiction and anecdotal experience that has seeped into the story as well <laughs> there is yeah really you know with I, w- I would say with all the horror i write but really just with everything i write that's the only like touchstone I have to reality. I just kind of take my own experiences and I distill them and magnify them and warp them and do stuff with them. So, yeah, there's always some seed of a real event in most of my stuff. And I also gauged from this story that there was quite a tribute to the drive-in kind of horror theater stories oh. and films as well. Oh, definitely. Yeah, those have had a huge influence on me. Yeah. And something I, I kind of get with a lot of your work is that they have an old school approach, but then you've reinvented them, then you've taken these tropes and made them more for a modern audience. I don't know if that's something you'd agree with or that would resonate with you. I think I would agree. I think it's really, for me, I would just look at it as a, as a scare tactic because you can kind of lull the reader into a relaxed state if you're giving them a story that they think they know in in like the old prescribed tradition you know but then you inject new stuff and um yeah i think that 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 probably is one of the main ways i try to scare the reader i never had thought about it and in fact recently i saw in your end of year review you'd mentioned the film starry eyes as your top film of last year and I mean, I just watched that the other day, and first of all, what an amazing film. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. I mean, secondly, that kind of... It, if you look at the structure and the story, it had a lot of nods towards just your traditional slasher, but then it had almost put it in a 
in a much more real context. To, um, yeah. to just sorry guys just to represent the listener here as well having not yet had a chance to see it can i just ask that we stay clear of spoilers please is that okay <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> sorry <laughs> sorry carry on go on <laughs> Stephen, you were yeah. about to say <laughs> Oh man, I totally forgot. I have no idea what I was going to say. <laughs> oh god. So Sorry. I I I I just said that Starry Eyes uh has taken the old school slasher kind of story structure and the tropes but then has has placed that within a much more real context. Oh, it totally has, but it also at the same time allows it to exist at a purely like metaphoric context too, because you can read it as as real or not real. I think, and those stories that you can read like that, they're always the most scary to me, because at the end, I'm not sure whether the bad stuff has really happened or not. You know, mm-hmm. and I don't think I don't think that's any kind of spoiler. I think I'm probably one of the only people who read it read this story like that. Yeah, I mean, I. Yeah, I think as long as we just make wide sweeping statements, then there's no <laughs> kind of like spoilers. Yeah. It's about a girl. We can say that, man. Yeah. No, D- Dan's not going to watch it now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> totally you threw rude. me off. <laughs> <laughs> Starry Eyes aside, what have been your kind of favorite standout movies of the past year? E- either ones that came out in 2014 or movies that you saw for the first time then? You know, I just, I'm just now, like, 45 minutes ago, back from Interstellar, and that movie just really blew me away. I liked it a, a very, I liked it a lot. I know it got a lot of kind of wish-wash, mishmash, or wish-washy reviews, I guess. Mm. Um, but, I mean, I was completely on board with it. I mean, it does have some, I mean, without spoiling it, some kind of Terminator problems i guess but i don't i don't consider them problems i consider them strengths um and yeah it's just a really fun movie and what else i liked i really liked coherence a lot an independent horror movie mm. um, much like story eyes but um it's such a smart movie in the first place because it limits its cast and it limits its locations you know with its very like premise which is just brilliant and um so it can get shot it can get it can get funded you know but um it's a terrifying, terrifying story, and it's a story with like no gore, and it doesn't really have suspense sequences either. It's more like it's terrifying on a like an ontological level, like it makes you question your own, I don't know, existence or being or something. Mm. And just to uh, very briefly jump back to thirteen, yeah. What? Why, out of all your stories, did you choose to open the collection with that specific one? <laughs> Oh, that's a good question. Why did I choose to start with 13? It was a complicated process getting this story in what I considered the right sequence. Um, Because there's there's certain stories that can't be by each other, you know? And I knew that 13, having kind of a kid narrator, couldn't be by another kid narrator. So that was the first thing. Um, You know, I guess there's there's, there's kind of like an old rule that you want to, with any collection you're doing, of course, you only want to include stuff that's your absolute best stuff. But within that, you always want to start strong. You want to have your title story be strong. And you want to have your end story be a good story. Um, which isn't to say the rest of your collection is trash or anything, but you want to feel completely confident in those three stories. Because some people will pick up a collection and just and they'll read it like that. They'll read first, last, and title. And, um, and you have to kind of order things to satisfy that kind of read or to protect against that kind of read, I guess. And I consider 13 one of the more solid stories in here. I think it, I think it's because of what you were saying, too, because it is playing with traditional horror tropes, you know? So it's got stuff that any reader picking it up is hopefully going to recognize at some level. And um, But then hopefully it intimates that there's going to be rugs pulled out from under feet and stuff. I've, um, I've got to ask, Stephen, uh, your story notes at the end of the book are, you know, some of the more intriguing uh, story notes I've read for a little while. I've got to ask you, wh- what is your favorite story in the book? Oh man, let me open my, let me open and look right quick. <laughs> um, wow, it's it's always it's always being like asked to pick this puppy to live and the rest of them to die. You know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know. Oh wow. 
possibly Uncle, maybe. I liked Uncle a lot. Um, and I, I think the reason I liked Uncle is because the end of that, I had, when I wrote that story, the whole time I was writing it, I had no idea I was gonna get how I was going to get out of this story. I thought this was just going to be an exercise. It was going to be something I wrote for 95%, and then I couldn't figure out the end. But then when I got to the end of that story, like the character had taken on his own life, and he did something which I wasn't expecting to do at all, and it creeped me out. And I love it when a story does that. It doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes you see the end and you craft your way towards it. Sometimes you just get a glimmer of it right when you think the ship is lost, you know? And I think that that's what happened to me with Uncle. And from looking cool. at the story notes, this was also a story that was commissioned for Paula. So it seems like, you know, when when Paula puts the deadline on, it brings out the absolute best in you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, she does. Um, <laughs> Yeah, her and her and Ellen Detlow, when they give me story assignments, um, I always know that I have a chance of producing something good or lucking into something, you know. And do you think it is it that they ask for something very specific, so then it gives you a focus rather than a general story? I think that's probably it. Yeah, like um, like um, let's see, I'm in Ellen Detlow's doll collection coming up here shortly. It may even be leaking out now but um she, um she hit me up for a story in that and she also gave me a list of all the things she did not want to see and that to me became an immense challenge how can i still tell a scary doll story because you know doll stories have been told over and over and over how can i tell that story and avoid these like 18 tropes that i'm supposed to Go, I'm supposed to go someplace different. And that idea or that, that foreknowledge that I'm going to have to go someplace different is very, I don't know, fertile for me. It, it, it gives me no choice but to, to um, explore places I wouldn't have otherwise gone. And when I do that, I tend to find workable stuff, you know. Can you um, give us an insight into what these 18 tropes were? or? Um, man, let me think. I do not remember, but it was like the first 18 things you think of with a doll story. (laughs) (laughs) And um, she wanted her, she wanted the doll collection to be not the typical doll stories. And and I haven't read the rest of them yet, but I I don't think mine is the typical doll story anyways. Cool, that's one to look out for. Uh, Excuse (laughs) me? That's definitely one to look out for. Uh, Yeah, yeah. And I think this is definitely what brings out the best within a story. If you take, okay, what do you think of when you think of this particular subgenre? Right, don't include any of that. Now write your story. (laughs) Exactly. I'm Actually, this afternoon, that's exactly what I'm doing. I got back from Interstellar, and, you know, we had our our time zone, like, misunderstanding here. And so I thought I had an hour to write. I was going to work on a story for Paula, actually, a mummy story. And, um... And that's that's exactly how I'm coming at it because she didn't. Paula didn't give me a list of things not to do, but um, I've read mummy stories, and I know the mummy mummy stories tend to develop or shamble around in, in the same way, which is fun, definitely. But I want to add my own twist to it, you know. Or not my own twist. It's not like I want to put my stamp on it. It's just I want to tell a story that people aren't expecting, you know. That's well, based on the the comments that we've had so far, Stephen, we've got no doubt, you know, that you're going to succeed on that because Paula is clearly bringing out the best in you. So <laughs> yeah. let, let us know when that one's due to be released, by all means. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> so you said that in Uncle, the character kind of took over and then it it delivered an ending that you didn't expect. So does this mean that you then had to go back and quite meticulously edit everything that had gone beforehand or did it just seamlessly fit into the story it's it did fit in um i don't know if i'm the one to say seamlessly but it (laughs) it, it felt like an organic expression of things that i had only been dimly aware of for the first like 90 90 90 or 95 percent of the story you know it's like it's like i'd been hiding those things in the back of my head so that I wouldn't foreshadow them too heavily or something, you know? Which I think that's what a lot of the writing process is that. It's blind, blinding yourself to what you're doing. It's not thinking, just kind of going by instinct. And one thing we didn't really touch on when we last had you on the podcast was uh, the editing and creative process. And I'm wondering, 
Is there a distinct mode when you're writing? So you're like, right, I'm in creating mode, now I'm in editing, or is it something that you flip between as you're going? It's definitely two modes for me. I do, when I'm writing a piece, as we all do, I'm going back two paragraphs and fixing this, and I think I'm editing, but really I'm still writing. Um, for me, the first draft um, phase of a thing is a very jittery mindset for me. Um a very like jittery, vulnerable, I don't know, situation to be in, I guess. But um, when it comes time for revision, I just put on some um, easy listening, adult, contemporary elevator music, and I'm um, cruise. I'm not jittery at all. I'm I'm confident because now I can think. I can apply principles I know about fiction, and I can look at the mechanics of the sentences, and I can see how the page lines out and everything. Um, none of that is really what I can do or what I feel confident doing when I'm writing. When I'm writing, I'm dealing solely with the story elements, and I'm trying to believe in this fictional space so completely that it ceases to become a fictional space. And in order to do that, I have to shut off the critical part of my mind, if that makes any sense. Mm. And when we had Richard Thomas on, I asked him about what he does for self-improvement and in terms of just honing the writing craft because what I've noticed is a lot of people who are already getting well established within uh, writing don't talk so much about what it is they specifically do to get better so I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about that whether it's seminars you attend or books that you read or how that yeah, works for it's, you. Well it's number one and number one and two it's both of those um one of the MFA programs I, I teach in, we have a residency twice a year, and we bring in speakers from all over the country and all over the world, um, writers, directors, producers, um, poets, everybody. And um, I go to as many of those seminars and classes as I can, and I listen to how they come at telling stories or revising stories or working in the industry, just all the many, many things they say. And I'm... Um, and aside from that, I, I read interviews of writers I respect and even writers I don't respect. And I listen to their podcasts and I read their articles, their blog posts, and all with the the aim of stealing tricks. You know, I, I want to get better. And yes, I do read, like I just now finished um, Steven Pinker's The Sense of Style, which has, for me, I, f I feel like it's changed the way I come at writing prose. Um, I think I'm, because I read that book, I order my clauses a little bit differently now. Um, I understand why clauses come in this order and not that order. And um, it's helped me immensely. I want to read that book again. I've assigned it for my students this semester. So I'll read it with them and hopefully understand it even better. Um, and I guess the other way I try to get better as a writer is... Um, well, I, I mean, I read other other writers, of course. You can't, you can't not do that. And I'm challenged by them. Like, you know, I just... I read that visible filth that you sent me of Nathan mm -hmm. Ballingrade's, and um, seriously, that that was so well written that I thought, why don't I even try? You know, that was scarier than I can be. You know, so I should just go write romance or horse <laughs> fiction, or something. You know, um, but I think it's good to be intimidated like that because it raises the stakes. Because now, next time I sit down to write a horror story, that visible filth is going to be in my head, and I'm going to think, well, this was scary, but I can do more. You know. Mm. Or I can push myself harder, anyways. Yeah, I think when you read something that, you know, you perceive as being a level above things that you've done before, yeah, there are, there are essentially going to be two reactions. Either it's going to inspire you and it's going to challenge you to better yourself, or you're just going to feel overwhelmed, and obviously it's the the former reaction that we're looking for. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's not bad to be overwhelmed for a week. Like when I read, the only two writers I can't read when I'm writing a novel are um, Vonnegut and Philip K. Dick because those guys both, they leave me wordless. I see what they've done on the page and I am and I just think, and I look at my own stuff and it's so paltry in comparison and I think, why am I even trying? You know, I love to read Dick and Vonnegut, don't get me wrong, but I love to read them when I'm not writing a novel. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. Was it Stephen King that said you can't expect to bowl somebody over with your writing until it's happened to you? So I guess, you know, the kind of adverse 
adverse kind of reaction of wow i can never match that you know maybe that's not kind of always the correct way to go i mean me and michael have kind of discussed this at length and i know that having read the visible phil for the first time through we're both like shit this is a serious piece of writing. Yeah, um, it really is, yeah. it's scary. But once you've kind of digested it, like you say, you know, it, it does kind of inspire you to, to get back on and, and try your best to do what you do yourself, really. So. Exactly, yeah. I mean, if, like, everybody watches Michael Jordan play basketball on YouTube, and um, we all know, everybody knows they'll probably never be as good as him, but um, you got to try, you know. You might get lucky one day. You might have one game where you make a shot that Michael Michael couldn't have made, you know. Um, <laughs> Or like 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 all bands all bands starting out in the garage, um, they probably know that they're finally not going to be Led Zeppelin, but that's no reason not to try to make good music. I think you know. Yeah, exactly. Well, well I know when Tim Ferriss is talking about business and kind of entrepreneurial aspirations, he says if you if you set your target ridiculously high then even if on some level you fail, it's not really a failure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But of, of the uh, tips and the seminars that you attended last year, mm-hmm. what, what would you say were the top three takeaways or tips that you learned? One of them was um, I was watching a panel of first time of debut novelists. I was just standing in the back, and um, and the moderator asked them at the end of their time period, "Do you have one piece of advice that you can give, you can impart to everybody?" And every one, every all three of them said, "Stay off Goodreads. Don't go to Goodreads and read your own reviews." And I never had done that, and um, and so I left there, and I went immediately to my hotel room, and I looked up, looked myself up on Goodreads, because I thought, well, that's what debut novelists say. I've got like twenty novels out, I'll be okay. I've got a thick enough skin. But like two hours later, I was um, wishing I would have heeded their advice, because I think we as writers should stay off Goodreads, because um, you the the positive reviews, you think your mom just has another um, online identity and she's doing it, but the negative <laughs> reviews. You take those; those like go right to your soul. They don't even mess around going through your eyes or anything. They just go right to the heart of you, and you take them as gospel truth, you know. And um, yeah, it's scary. I think it's not productive, anyways, to spend your time haunting Goodreads. Um, let me think. And you know, a screenwriting seminar I went to. Um, it was about taking notes, I think, and um, or taking notes from producers or from executives and stuff, and um. And they said, the single best thing you can do when you go into that office or into that meeting room, that conference room, aside from you know listening, is prop a, prop a notebook up, a pad of paper, and always be writing. And that makes the people who are giving you notes, be they producers, executives, whoever, that tells them that what they're saying has work, that you're taking it seriously. Because a lot of the stuff they say is going to be you know probably – pretty easily dismissed because they're maybe they've missed some part of the story or who knows, who knows for all the reasons that people have bad ideas that they'll have bad ideas like but um if you're writing something down in your notebook then they it becomes a more productive meeting i think um and i've been in those situations and so now when i go back to them i'm going to be sure to be writing something that they can't see i may just be drawing bart simpson but mm-hmm. i'll be doing something you know um, let's see, the next most productive one I went to, let me think. You know, it's probably a dialogue workshop I went to, and um, it was given by a playwright, a friend of mine, Mickey Birnbaum, and he had us do an exercise at the end, which I won't um, like give his exercise away, I don't think it's any big secret, but I think it's something that dramatists do that fiction writers, or I had never encountered these kind of dialogue exercises, and um it made me kind of think differently about dialogue. Everybody always says that dialogue is kind of like the distilled essence of your character or something. And I always think, yeah, that's all that sounds good, but what do they really sound like? But, uh, it, that workshop made me realize that you've, yes, it is a distilled essence. And I mean, yes, it is a, um, it, yes, it has to sound real, but also it needs to be doing something. And I mean, I guess I knew that at some level, but doing those exercises in that class really hammered it home for me anyways. And so when you're writing dialogue yourself, uh, let, let's say that in the first draft 
you map out quite a full conversation, mm -hmm. then when you go back to it, how do you know what to include and what to take away? Because I, I guess with it being the essence of your characters, as you put it, it uh, and I mean, we're always told, let's kill our darlings, as it were, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. the dialogue can really be the core of that. So I guess yeah. for a lot of people, it can be a real struggle knowing what has to go. Definitely. That is really hard. Um, I mean, you can do the old thing where you cut off the heads and the tails, you cut off the hellos and goodbyes, but that goes kind of without saying in a dialogue mm -hmm. session on the page and a conversation on the page. But um, one thing I've had, I just wrote a big like 150,000 word novel and it's very dialogue driven. And so I'm peeling back through it right now and doing what you're saying. I'm, I'm winnowing the dialogue down and I'm finding that there, that I do two types of dialogue. I do dialogue that is revealing of the character and that moves the plot forward. And I do dialogue that I think is hilarious and everybody's going to love, you know, and mm -hmm. what I'm finding, what I'm finding is I have to cut out all the stuff that I think people are going to love and that I think is hilarious. I just have to leave stuff that actually serves the story, but learning to make that distinction is quite tricky. Yes. And do you think that do you think that there's a danger when people try and include accents or, I guess, specific phrases or ticks that people have within their dialogue? It, it can definitely, if it depends if the writer, him or herself, you know, has a good ear or not. People with a good ear, they can get away with it. I don't think I have a very good ear. So I, instead of trying to render someone's diction through phonetics, I'll usually default to syntax to word order a little bit, but really my main thing I'll do is I'll put an umbrella, umbrella description at top. I'll say, um, this guy talks with a Southern accent. I'll say that after some fashion such that every time we see him, hopefully that umbrella is still over it such that we remember that he kind of has a draw. He kind of crawls his words out and stuff. Um, but, but some people can really do it on the page. They can really render a dialect without, um, reducing a whole culture to a stereotype you know mm. um I'm, I'm not i don't think i'm so good at that though so i i don't try because i think i would well not not that i don't try because i think i'll fail um i don't try because i have tried and i've seen what it looks like and it looks mm. like crap you know <laughs> so, so I, try to do, I try to do it different ways you know i guess it can be very difficult to go back and to re-edit that kind of stuff anyway because Obviously, when you're rereading it, you are putting that accent that you want to be there on yeah. the character in your head or out loud. So Definitely. it Definitely. does make it very tricky to know, yeah. you know when you've got it right and when you've absolutely mm -hmm. failed and <laughs> rendered yeah. it a cliche. <laughs> Definitely. You know, one of my big problems with talking about that kind of stuff is when I'm going back and revising a work, um, I'll get to a paragraph and I'll realize... Um, I like get a, a sense that I need to say tenderly, you know, that for that. So that's going to do something that's going to polarize or inflect or do something that I need done right here. And so I'll rewrite like the first three sentences of that paragraph such that there's a tenderly in there. And then I'm like, all right, I did that. And then I go read the second three sentences of that paragraph and there's tenderly, you know, I already did it the first time through. So then I have to go back and undo all my changes that I did to the front part of the paragraph. Um, that's really my biggest slowdown in revising is that I realized something needs to happen here. And so I make it happen, and then it's already happened like one percent further into the story. Yeah. And just a, a final question on dialogue. I mean, I think we all know that you know generally you want people to say things. You don't want to add all these wild adjectives uh -huh. and verbs describing yeah. <laughs> how yeah. they did it. But um, I mean, sometimes just a little description can add color so do you have any rules or tips in terms of knowing when to include a little bit more and when to just keep it as is i i would say uh, i guess my rule of thumb i never really thought about it though is i'll allow myself one deviation from he said she said a page you know whether that's going to be a he corrected she replied he answered um she muttered whatever it's going to be I try to do that maybe once a page, if that. Usually, uh, I think it probably comes out to like once every three or four pages. But um, 
I don't. I, I, mean, I don't think a lot of people hold it as a really hard and fast rule. You can't do anything but said. I don't. I don't quite agree with that. Um, I, I mean, you do want to avoid things like. Um, I'll go over there. She whispered softly. You know, because how else can you whisper? But um, so you want to. You don't want to do stupid stuff. But um, it's not. It's not. It's not. I don't think it's bad to drop an adverb or an adjective around around that kind of stuff at all. Yeah, I think it was King who in. On writing, he was talking about things. So you use whispered softly, and he said, "Well, you'd you'd use a descriptor if they whispered in a way that you wouldn't expect. So it's more of a screaming uh, whisper or a loud whisper." <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. But um, I I said that was going to be the last question on dialogue, but now you've <laughs> you've brought up another one um, mm-hmm. when you were talking about you have no hard and fast rules and previously you'd said that uh, a novel you're working on at the moment is a large percentage of dialogue yeah. so i mean i am wondering if you've set yourself any limits in terms of the percentage of dialogue that can be on uh, a page or the length that a conversation can go on for you know, I well, I guess to back up a little, the my idea or my model or my challenge for this was I read Gillian Flynn's um, Dark Places, which is a pretty pretty solid novel. But then when I got to, you know, I finished it, and then I got to thinking about it for a long time, and I realized that novel is just a series of long conversations, really. And there's also a novel by Sandor Marai called Embers, which is just a series of long conversations. And I thought. What a weird form. Why had I never realized that that's the form of probably 40% of the novels out there? It's just a series of long conversations. And um, the reason I haven't done that is because it's really hard to drive a novel with dialogue, I think. Um, especially, I think, for me, because I don't come to dialogue naturally. I had to, when I came to grad school, my professors had to beat it into me that I had to do dialogue because I didn't want to do any dialogue at all. I said I was going to be the one person who never did dialogue, but they made me. And um, I wrote my novel Demon Theory to teach myself dialogue. I made my my hard and fast rule was that for that was that every single line of dialogue is going to be quoted. There's going to be no paraphrasing at all. And um, and since then I've become a lot more comfortable with dialogue. But um, with this novel, I didn't have any rules about how much dialogue can be on a page. But um, it's really it's really not about you know how it looks visually or anything. It's really about the pace at which the story moves because if you have two pages of dialogue that's going to move really quick it's really snappy and but i realized that you need um like expansion and contraction expansion and contraction and um the dialogue is a contraction and the narration for me is the expansion that's where you slow down and you look at the cityscape and you go through the pasture and you you eat and that kind of stuff um those are very necessary moments you have to break the rhythm in a novel, or you have to establish a rhythm, I guess, like just fast, slow, fast, slow. But for me, it's expansion and contraction, and that's how I think of dialogue working in a story. So you you spoke about it within a novel. Now, within short fiction, I mean, there are stories that are exclusively dialogue, so do you think that is a form that lends itself to a more uh, dialogue-heavy approach? That's a good question. Um, you know, I mean, yeah, Terry Bisson's They're Made Out of Meat is the most famous all-dialogue one we've got, of course, and it's brilliant and wonderful and doesn't need anything but dialogue. Or its only dialogue form is kind of where it gets its humor and its power. Um, I do think that when I do short fiction, I have less dialogue than I do in a novel because – when I write short fiction, like this mummy story I'm supposed to write, it's got a cap on it, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, I'll have to look at the email, but it's probably four or 5,000 words. So my suspicion is that most of the conversations in there are going to be kind of like excerpts from bigger conversations. you know. So they'll, they'll go on for half a page, and then we'll jump ahead to the story and move ahead. And I mean, hopefully the dialogue will be moving the story too. But um, yeah, I think it's... It work, I think dialogue gets different license in the story in short fiction and what's the longest you've had a first draft of a story that you've then cut down as in like the kind of percentage that you've had to cut to get the the story within the parameters of that word count probably about 1800 to 2000 
words, I think, you know, which is like 15 pages. Mm. And it's not easy to do that at all. Um, and forever afterwards, that story, whenever I see it, it always seems like um, I remember when you were bigger, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's the way it goes, you know? <laughs> so in terms of uh, daily habits you have, and your morning routine, what does that look like? Because I think it's always interesting to see how writers and artists start the day because it normally sets you up for how you're going to go on. These last, um, I started this big novel I just wrote in late September, and I just finished it right after Christmas. And um, I was doing a lot of traveling, but when I was able to be home, I mean, I wrote on the road too, but that's not really scheduled writing. When I was able to be home... I found that, um, you know, I wake up at six or seven and I would usually find my way to the keyboard, to the computer by eight. And I would push on till about 10 usually. And that's usually about an hour and a half of good writing and 30 minutes of realizing that I'm not doing good writing anymore, you know? <laughs> and then I bounce to the gym. Then I watch something stupid at lunch. And then I come back and I'll do after lunch, between lunch and five, I'll usually do two hour and a half writing sessions. And I'm, um, I'll take a break, go get the kids from school at three, something like that, you know. And um, I try to stay away from it at night. I can't always do that. But um, because the problem is if I start writing at nine, then I think I'm chasing a big fish and I go until three in the morning and then I'm screwed for the next day because I didn't get no sleep, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so, but, yeah, if I can write four or five hours a day, I can make a lot of good progress. But... Right now, I've got a semester starting up on Tuesday, and, um, and I'm already doing a semester with another place right now, a quarter, and so my schedule is not going to be as um, loose as it was these last three or four months, and I'm going to be back to the model of stealing time to write, you know, stealing mm -hmm. 10 minutes here and 25 minutes there, and then staying up late to write, and then sometimes waking up at 4.30 to write before everybody else is awake, you know? But I, I, it, just however you get it done, I think, is the thing that matters. Um, you know, writers say that your fiction writing is a muscle. you got to keep it in shape. And I do agree with that. But I also think that it's really good to take breaks. Um, like, since I finished that novel on December 28th or something like that, um, I don't think I've written a word of fiction. I've just been... I have a futon in my office and I finally cleaned that futon off. And I've been laying on that futon for hours and just reading and reading and being happy. Because for me, while I love writing... Um, I think I probably love reading more. Um, so I really appreciate the times between projects when I can just read. Mm. And you said that if you start writing too late, you can then kind of screw yourself over for the next day. So do you yep. have a very rigid time that you will get up every day, regardless of when you went to sleep? <laughs> Yeah, I usually get up at six or seven every day. Mm. Yeah, I'm just programmed like that, I guess. Well, not. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have kids and a family and dogs, and they they make me wake up. You know? Yeah. No, I guess if your children want feeding, you can't really say no. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off! I'm sleeping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, something else that you mentioned was going to the gym. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of people talk about the importance of having a fitness routine mm -hmm. um so yeah. i wondered first of all what is your fitness routine and i mean how much do you attribute doing that to kind of your success and just setting yourself up for creating yeah um you know i was, I was listening to produ a, pr and a producer talk recently at a seminar and um Somebody was asking her about working with um, a director who is really hard to work with or an actor who's really an ego trip or a production that seemed to be flawed from the beginning. And she said um, she and people she knows will get on board projects like that, but they're really um, insistent that when they do that, they set aside like an hour and a half each day to go to the gym or do yoga or play basketball or whatever because I think and it's, it's that's the way it works with me um I need to be doing something that is not with my mind you know and working going to the gym is not using my brain at all you know um and I just been programmed like that I grew up with a mom who 
um, wouldn't watch TV unless she was like doing sit ups and stuff. And um, and so I remember in high school, every time I hear that song, every time I hear Zeppelin's Cashmere come on the radio, my stomach muscles tighten up because that used to be my my stomach crunch song in high school, you know. And it goes for like nine minutes, and it was way too long, I think. <laughs> but but um. Um, and so then I came out of high school to college and I remember in college undergrad, I was working out three times a day, you know, and in grad school dialed that back to about one time a day. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Mm. But I'm at the gym, um, come snow or whatever, um, an hour every day, you know, like even the, on the January 1st here, my gym was closed, which I thought was not cool. So I did a trial membership at another gym. It was a huge headache, but just so I could work out on one on that one day, you know, use one day of my trial membership. Um, yeah, because I get if I can't work out, I go I get jittery and crazy. Um, used to what I did, I had a basketball goal in my driveway, and I wrote a lot of my novels. I would write for an hour or two and go outside and shoot ba- shoot baskets and come inside and write, and then go back out and shoot. That was my rhythm, but um, lately I've had so many knee and ankle surgeries and shoulder mess ups and back injuries that um, basketball requires a lot more recuperation than it used to. So now I just go to the gym. And do you find that when you're there, you are multitasking in the sense that you're either listening yeah. to some music or, or, or doing something else at that point? Uh, I usually am either listening to an audio novel or reading a book, yes. Um, or sometimes I listen. I listen to music too, but I always have a notebook and a pen with me because I get like blindsided, blindsided by ideas that I have to do in this thing I'm writing. You know, mm-hmm. I carry these little, these little waterproof um, contractors notebooks that I get at the hardware store, and they're perfect. They're really rugged and tough, so they can bounce all around the gym. And is it more a, a weightlifting or a cardio routine that you're following? Uh, mostly, mostly cardio. I do. I mean, I do. I do weights, but I'm not too serious about it you know i don't really want to be all muscly or nothing um i just love to get on a bike or an elliptical or a stair stepper or whatever the gym i might has and just kind of try to turn my brain off for 45 minutes or an hour yeah i mean there might be some people listening who are wondering what this has to do with the writing but for <laughs> i mean for for me having read a lot of studies into these areas while some people might think well okay if i spend an hour a day at the gym that's an hour less writing but it seems mm-hmm. to be because it gets that blood flowing and it it really yeah. is a stimulus that releases these endorphins that you'll actually find that what yeah. you're doing post workout makes you more productive yeah uh, the amount the amount of writers who have said in kind of interviews you know oh i had a breakthrough on this plot when i was you know halfway up a hill on a walk near my house and I had to run home and you know make the notes that i thought of while i was out you know exercise mm-hmm. really does seem to be a benefit to the the writing muscle as it were it, it totally I, yeah i totally 100 percent believe that you know um I remember, you know, I was laid up one summer and I couldn't really do basketball, so I did hacky sack, which was just as good as basketball. And it, it that like used to, I thought basketball was a magic key to unlocking the fiction part of my brain or something. But I realized it's not basketball; it's just something that's not fiction. You know, it's just doing something <laughs> um, and doing something with my body. You know, it's not just like going and driving or something. Not that driving is necessarily easy, but um, just doing something that just requires like um involuntary stuff in my brain you know it does allow the fiction the stories to to cook i think now in terms of looking at this year 2015 uh have you got anything coming out this year because i remember you saying that uh, i think it was your agent had said to not put anything out this year but i don't know if that in, that is uh, just the novel form or if we'll be seeing short stories from you and and also what the strategy and approach is behind that um there yeah there are, i'll definitely have short stories out um i don't have any novels out for the first time in a lot of years now um because my agent says that i was having too many novels and i probably i agree with her you know um but there are two books coming out with my name on them anyways. Um, one is the Faster Redder Road Selected Fiction or Stories of Stephen Graham Jones. Um, a guy named Theo Van Alst is doing it through New Mexico Press. And um, then that's, that's in April, I think. And then in the, 
in the fall, there's a critical companion to the fictions of Stephen Graham Jones, which um, I'm doing a big interview for that. But of course, I don't have any hand in the critical stuff. Um, so, I mean, I'll still be on somebody's radar somewhere <laughs> anyways. Um, and there's there's more stuff, but I uh, can't talk about it yet. I'm under various gag orders, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I, I was wondering if in terms of the strategic approach, it's more or let's just <laughs> rein in the amount that you're putting out so, yep. that, so yep. that then you, know, you become even more established so that each time you put more mm-hmm. stuff out, you get a better deal. Correct. That, that's, that's exactly the strategy that she's pushing. Um, she says that I need to make my books an event rather than something that people assume, you know? Mm. The, um, Stephen, does it, you know, kind of with, you know, a, a best of and a critical study of your work, does it feel like people are kind of, I don't know, like you hear this a lot from kind of sportsmen, maybe, you know, when they win kind of like the NBA or, you know, the, the Champions League and football or soccer, as we call it, you know, does that make you feel that you've kind of, achieved all that you want to now people are kind of writing these kind of books about you or you know putting kind of you know accolades that you'd associate with kind of i don't know maybe the end of a career or something like that do you feel like any kind of i don't know emotions about those books that are coming out you know i told one of my editors don doria don doria at sam hain i was sitting at a table with him in portland i think it was but um and I said, "Does this mean I'm dead? They're doing a selected works." And he he, he said, "He said no, no. He said selected works are good. Collected works are bad. You know, <laughs> if they're if they're collecting all your stuff, that means you're dead." But um, but um, yeah. I mean, uh, hopefully, the selected works would just be like volume one or something. You know, that that'd be ideal. As as for yes, it it does to me. It does mean, or it does to me indicate that I'm reaching the people that I'm trying to reach in some sense, you know, but there's always another horizon too. You've got to always keep, um, I think you never can like, well, you can be satisfied, but just never rest, I guess is, is the way I feel about it. You know, um, so many writers I've seen who won a prize or get a movie made from their stuff or have really good sales or get on some list, they're like, all right, that's great. And you don't see anything from them for six or eight years. And um, I, I, that's not the model I want to follow. You know, I want to always be doing like a one-two punch over and over. You know, if I make it on some list or win some prize or do whatever, I want that to be the thing that happens for that six months. But then the next six months, there's going to be something else happening, you know? Yeah, of course. I mean, it must be difficult, you know, obviously being as prolific as you are, like shifting goalposts and, you know, I know you kind of can't talk too much about the projects that you've got coming up, but, you know, what what are you aiming for kind of next? Mm -hmm. You know, I know we talked about the possible rom-com last time you were on the show. Yeah, I'd still do What what kind of aims are we looking at, you know, for for this year? Is there still kind of... You know, I think... The white elephant, you know, the, sorry, yeah. the white whale that you haven't got, the white elephant. <laughs> you know, my, my, if I have a white whale, it's probably that I want to write, um, I would love to write a novel like Dan Simmons' Hyperion. I would love to write a big, huge science fiction novel. Um, it's not It's not necessarily about page, about, you know, page number. It's about the, I don't know, the depth of the imagination, I guess, the how, how well somebody has imagined this space. Um I've, that's always been my goal since I was a little kid. I wanted to be a science fiction writer, and I never have felt like I'm good enough to do it yet. And I think I've probably set the bar too high by reading Von and getting Dick, you know, <laughs> I guess. Um, but I still hope to do that. If there is, if I do have a white whale, that's probably it, you know, just to write good, compelling science fiction. And there's good stuff happening. I mean, it's not just all Von and getting Dick. There's John Scalzi. There's... um. Oh, what's that guy's name? He did Ready Player One, which is pretty brilliant. You know, there's there's so much good stuff happening. Um, but yeah, it is weird for me. I mean, it's it's it, what's weird for me right now in, the, in this year in 2015 is that I've got I think four completed novels in the drawer. No, five now with this one I just wrote. Um, it'll hopefully be completed. I mean, it's completed, but hopefully it'll be polished and publishable before too long here. So I guess I got five books in the drawer, and um. So that feels really weird to me because I'm used to having 
publishers call me and say, I need a book. And I'll say, um, I don't have one. Can you wait a few weeks? You know, but, um, so yeah, it's, I wonder if these books will ever get published. I think they're some of my best stuff, but, um, for a while there, I was just writing so, so much, you know, that it, it, it was more than like the shelf could hold or something, you know? Yeah. <laughs> No, I just, just thought that was an interesting thing, you know, somebody who's achieved so much just to see what kind of keeps you ticking over. But it's kind of, you know, reassuring almost to see that, you know, you've had so many books out and yet still, you know, there are goals that you're chasing. It's, you know, that's kind of a little bit inspiring in itself. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, you know what, what, I, what I really want is just to connect with readers. And sometimes sometimes it's one reader and sometimes it's 5,000 readers, you know. Um, but... One of my favorite like letters I ever got from a reader was um, for Bleeding to Me, I guess. Somebody wrote me, and it got to me somehow. I forget how. This was before social media, before I was on it anyways. And, um, and he said that a story of mine, Bleeding to Me, the title story from the Bleeding to Me collection, he said um, he had lost his brother when he was in high school. And he said he's been dealing with it for years and years. And this story, Bleeding to Me, really resonated with him and helped him a whole lot. And um. That's that's the kind of experiences or that I as a writer would like more of, I guess, you know. And I'm I guess the more sales you get, the higher the chance that that's going to happen, you know. But I mean, it's not all about cash and royalty checks or film option money and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, it is about that, but it's really just about connecting with people. That's that's the magic of fiction for me is that my book can go to a spaceport in 400 years and possibly reach a culture that I never imagined. And that's just purely magic to me, that that in connecting with somebody that I've never guessed existed. Now, I, I don't know if this is going to go into territory that you can't actually talk uh-huh. about on the podcast. Yeah. But I wondered what, what it was that had inspired the agent change. Ah, um... You know, I'd been with my agent for 14 years. We'd been together since we were both just babies on the publishing scene, you know. And um, I just thought it was time to mix it up, you know. Uh, that's, that's pretty much basically it. I, was, I wasn't really dissatisfied or anything. Um, and she hadn't done anything wrong, my, my, my previous agent. I just thought um, at a certain point in your career, you want to try things from a different angle, you know. And that's what I'm doing. Well, it sounds like you're taking, yeah, a completely different approach now. So, it, if if nothing else, then it's an experiment, and yep. you, you've yep. got to do that to see what the the result is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't want to die with questions, you know, with unanswered questions. You want to have asked everything you can ask. I think. And I think, in terms of your art, you're doing exactly that. I mean, particularly with the experimentation in terms of other genres. Mm-hmm. So you you did say just backtracking to your conversation with Dan about uh, putting out a science fiction novel that being a big target for you. Mm-hmm. Um, now we spoke about tropes to avoid. So do you now have a list of things that you definitely don't <laughs> want to do within that science fiction <laughs> novel? <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, I guess I don't want to have a explosion that makes noise in space you know (laughs) (laughs) i just i mean i read a lot of science fiction and you do get a sense of um what the audience prefers and tolerates poorly i guess um but you know really one kind of insight into that is if you go to the websites of all the the science fiction magazines both big and small and read through their submission guidelines some of them have a comprehensive list of tropes that are played out in science fiction and um you can use those either as idea starters or you can use those as fences either, either way i think but um it's really good to know the field anyways i see a lot of writers come into something and you can tell that they don't read horror but they're writing horror they they, they thought they had a scary idea but they don't realize that um poe did that story 80 percent similar 140 years ago you know yeah, I think when you start writing in a genre that you're not as familiar with, depending on the competency of the writer, it can either be an absolute car crash <laughs> or or it can actually bring something 
quite fresh to the table. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. with, with, with the latter example, I'm actually thinking uh, the other, I guess it was last year now, when we watched The Bay. Yeah. Um, and that was, who was that directed by? Uh, Barry Levinson directed mm -hmm. it, and he hadn't really strayed into this kind of mm -hmm. uh, found footage horror uh, mm -hmm. cinema before. And for me, I thought that worked absolutely perfectly and it yeah. did it did give us something that we hadn't really seen before in in a genre that's becoming increasingly oversaturated i, I agree yeah the bay kind of creeped me out definitely and i think you're right that 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 was the benefit or the result of somebody coming to it who doesn't usually play in that area you know because he was able to set the story up for like 80 percent of the story where we thought it was going to go one predictable way but then when the little bug things whatever they are come around you're like you throw your hands up and run yes. away you know <laughs> <laughs> but you're right about um you know i teach undergraduates as well as graduate students and lots of the undergraduates my fiction workshop might very well be the first encounter with the mechanics and the craft of fiction that they've had so that um what that means for me is that the initial stories they turn in um They'll be raw in the sense that they're maybe not mechanically correct and all that, but that's all you can deal with that. But every once in a while, one of them will do something that is so what we would consider out of bounds for fiction writing, but they don't know it's out of bounds because they don't know where the fences are. And it's really cool when they when they do that kind of stuff. They're like, oh, I didn't know you couldn't um, fast forward eighty years inside of a single sentence and then come back, you know. But um. They, or, or do it all, or do my story all in passive voice or whatever it is and um, I try to cultivate that all I can because I think fiction needs that new DNA to remain vital you know and we know that experimentation is so important so I suppose yeah if you don't actually know what the rules are <laughs> then there are no <laughs> boundaries and so I, I, I guess I could see how that could bring out some really interesting stuff. I mean, I'm sure it also brings out some pretty <laughs> terrible yeah. writing, but occasionally, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, you'll see something really creative and wow, I yeah. didn't know that exactly. would work. <laughs> yeah, and I, I'll ask them oftentimes at the end of the semester, I'll say, listen, I know you're going to go you know, back home and run, run your family's business. I know you're going to go to Tibet for the next 10 years or whatever they're going to do. I'll say, but this trick you did in the story right here, if you're not going to use it, can I use it? And they they always say yes, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and I, but I tell them that I'll always give them um, acknowledgement for it. You know, I won't pretend like I came up with it. Mm. And do you find a lot of people who pass through your creative writing courses do then go on to to, to continue with that? I mean, so I did an undergraduate creative writing course um, and whilst there are a percentage of us that I see that are still out there writing or within the publishing business, unfortunately, you will see people who will pass through it and then maybe find that, uh, well, <laughs> invariably find the money isn't quite <laughs> there. And yeah, yeah. whilst they would like to be writing short stories or longer pieces within their spare time, the, mm -hmm. the jobs they invariably get don't actually yeah. allow for that amount of time. <laughs> you, I see that happen a lot, yeah. Um, and it's, I don't think it's necessarily bad either because really what's happened is now this person who is now in marketing or who's now selling cars or whatever, I think they're still using their fiction skills. You know, They're telling a story about this mm -hmm. used Subaru or they're um, using audience manipulation in the advertising field and all that. And I think that the skills you learn by crafting stories are applicable in so many parts of life, you know? So yes, these people aren't showing up in anthologies or on the shelf, on the fiction shelf anyways, but um, I think they're still, a lot of them are still writers inside, you know? I think with, with writing, it's the one craft that you can really come to um, later in life or that with age you get better because as you mm -hmm. say it's storytelling so I mean to really succeed at that you need to have these life experiences to draw from so you know if you've just gone through high school 
and then college and university, mm-hmm. and then you decide you're going to lock yourself up in your room <laughs> and write. Yeah. And th- yeah. There's an argument that you don't have that much to draw from, so it might be better going out there and getting these experiences and then coming back to the writing table. Exactly, yeah. What they say, go out and get your heart broken, all that kind of stuff, mm. you know? And I do think that that is so, so important. It, it gives you like a, I don't know, a context or something. It kind of, you learn about what really matters, I guess, you know? Because you're right, coming out of high school, you think a certain set of things matter, but as you, you know, 12 years later, you realize that none of that matters, you know? Um, which isn't to say you can't get beautiful novels that deal with the high school issues. You definitely mm. can. But, um, but yeah, I, th- I think that experience is definitely what makes makes gives writers their fuel. Anyways, um, but then you got people like Emily Dickinson just sitting up in their attic room writing poems with a lot of dashes in them. You know, so <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It works for some people. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and you can learn so much about the author through reading their fiction. I remember when Graham Joyce was talking at a This Is Horror event. He was saying that uh, the things that seem more unbelievable or more like absolute fabrication within a lot of his stories are the bits that are real and are taken from <laughs> life. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. I, I, what I found is going around doing readings and stuff, um, sometimes I'll be reading a piece and I'll have like two or three lines in it that I think are funny. And the audience tends not to laugh at those moments. They laugh at these other moments that I never anticipated. And um, it's it's weird to me that I can so poorly anticipate an audience's reaction sometimes. But um, what I do then is I don't delete those parts that they laugh at. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> I try to sensitize myself to that kind of I don't know play or construction or whatever, such that I can repeat it. Hopefully. So do you find with some of your readings you'll bring in a piece that isn't quite finished and then you've got the reading environment as a testing ground? I, some, when I have a longer reading, like 45 minutes, I usually try to bring in a brand new piece and try it out on the crowd to see if they tolerate it, you know, I guess. But sometimes I'll do readings like in a bookstore, you know, 25 minutes, 30 minutes. And usually in a bookstore, I'm trying to sell a certain book. And so I need to push that book. And so I'll usually not try new stuff. It just depends on the audience, I guess. And have you ever had a kind of Chuck Paulo Nick moment where you've had a real visceral <laughs> reaction from the crowd? I guess this applies more to the horror stuff. Yeah, yeah. I've never I never had anybody um pass out like they do for guts, you know. But I always think with guts they're not passing out because of the corn. That's when everybody's supposed to pass out when or the peanuts. That's what mm. that's what makes people pass out. But um I always think they pass out because in the first line of that story this story lasts about as long as you can hold your breath. And I always think people start holding their breath then and they pass out like two pages later <laughs> from <laughs> oxygen deprivation. But um, probably the best response I've had like that uh, in that family would be, I was reading down in um, at the Texas State Cemetery last October, maybe two Octobers ago. And it was a reading, I want to say it was at 10 o'clock or maybe midnight, really pretty late. I was one of four, maybe five readers. Um Let's see, what, Lindsay Hunter, Amelia Gray. Um, and um, it was a really cool setting. We read right after R.L. Stein, I guess. He had a big event, and then we went on. But um, um, I read, a, what did I read? I read the first section of this story I have, Notes from the Apocalypse, which actually shows up as the Age of Hasty Retreats in my book, Zombie Sharks with Metal Teeth. And it's a short little piece. I can read it in five, maybe six minutes. But... Um, I read it and I looked up to the crowd. It was a pretty big crowd in, you know, a nighttime cemetery. And they were just shocked at that story. Or they had this look like um, we were expecting to laugh, you know, and it's not, it's not a story about laughing, you know. And um, and then I had after the reading, I was kind of circulating among the people who had been there. And I had two or three people tell me that um, I made them or somebody standing beside them cry. And it's just a, it's just a I mean, it, it's a little zombie story, you know. Um <laughs> But it's neat to to give to deliver to an audience something that's not quite what they're expecting, and just to set them back on their heels. And I think I got lucky that time when I did it. And just returning to the writing process, we've spoke 
a little bit about what to do, particularly uh, with regards to dialogue, but what are perhaps the top three things you would say people should not do when writing? Uh, okay. Um, one thing is... Yeah, there's two. Th I can think of two things, actually. They're really specific things. Never describe your character by having that character look in the mirror. I think that comes off pretty terrible. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's like, and especially if it's a first-person narrator, um, I looked in the mirror at my evenly spaced eyebrows and my, my white teeth and my grin was a little off and, <laughs> and all, that, all that kind of stuff. You know, it comes off quite corny. Um, I think another rule that seems to work all the time is never start a piece of fiction with somebody waking up. The only exception to that is if they wake up as a cockroach, I guess, then it can mm -hmm. work. <laughs> but um, nearly every time that fails. Um, and I think my third one would probably be more broad, and it's not mine at all. I think it's really Elmore Leonard's. Um, he says to start, or I think he and Vonnegut both say this, actually. Um, to start, they say start the story as near to the end as possible. And that's something I've had to learn through the years. I used to think you start at the beginning, but now I know that what you do is you have a big, huge, epic story in mind, and then you tell the last 15% of it, you know? That's mm -hmm. the interesting part. And do you think with the waking up, that would also be a kind of wider rule that we can apply to, to chapters or segments of stories, mm -hmm. you know, unless they're being w woken up in such a dramatic way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I, th I think probably so. Um, and, uh, and detective novels would get a little bit, a bit of a pass on that because those guys are either getting knocked out at the end of chapters or passing out drunk, you know, so yeah. they usually, <laughs> they're doing some form of waking up at the first of some chapters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, do you think perhaps in, in a scenario where they, they are knocked out or or pass out, w mm -hmm. would you necessarily, in terms of just getting really into the the story, want to resume when they wake up again next, or would you maybe want to to start further along the process? It's that's it's really tricky. It depends on what you've been doing in the novel before that, because if it's a novel where you've been kind of changing scenes and going from the protagonist to the subplot characters to the wider context, if you've got like different people you can focus on, then yes, the detective gets knocked out. Then you can focus on what's going on in Washington D.C. right now, or what's going on back at the house and all that kind of stuff. And then you come back to the detective, and he's getting interrogated, tied up to a chair, and he's already awake, of course. But if you've got a novel where it's single focus, where you're only looking at the detective, then it almost requires you to show his or her waking up after whatever fashion, you know? And it's it's hard to do it in a in a way that hasn't been done before, but um it does seem to be necessary to do it. And I think the the workaround to that is have your detective not get a, got not get knocked out more than once in a book. You know, <laughs> then, then it doesn't become a pattern. You know, because too many too many detective novels depend on that for a cliffhanger. You know, I walked in the room and then something flew towards my head and then I fell down. You know, they get knocked out and then that that's the cliffhanger for like thirty, like every third chapter or something. You know, and then it does become kind of. A joke of how this detective is going to wake up and in what circumstances i just think we need uh, the detectives to train a little bit harder maybe <laughs> take on some martial arts and then they won't exactly. get or wear a helmet. Out so frequently <laughs> <laughs> so i mean i think already we've had so many great kind of tips and takeaways that people listening to the podcast will get an awful lot of value out of uh but one one other thing that I guess people struggle with is so once they've made the time to write or once they've managed the schedule so that they can conceivably fit it in, uh, it's staying productive. So do you have any productivity tips or, or perhaps even apps or things that you use to ensure that you are on target and focused? You know, I've heard about those apps, yeah. Um, I never have used one yet, but I hear people who use them say they're actually pretty cool. Um, I was reading some novelist's tips on his blog recently, and one of his big big tips was don't bother with the word count. And um, 
and what I thought immediately was screw you. So I turned my word count on so that it was on the whole time I was writing, you know, and um, it didn't seem to make any difference. I mean, but I think that's because I'm no longer nervous that I'm not going to hit the requisite amount of pages. You know, I know that really the, really the task is going to be trying to reel this in under three or 400 pages. That's going to be the real task, you know? Um, but let me think what not to do, what not to do. You know, I think it would just be, don't allow yourself the easy way out. Um, well, I mean, first always write yourself into a corner, but then never allow yourself the easy way out. I think you become such a better writer when you make your character get out in an honest way, rather than delivering them, a parachute of um, knives or something, you know? And so make yourself right, I think. I think that is probably what happened with Breaking Bad that made it such compelling television because you look at so many other series and it's predictable. You know how the character is going to get out of that situation, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. with Walter White... <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> you never really knew what he was going to do. And I, I don't really yeah. think, having watched all of it, that there, there was really a single moment where he took the easy way out. And I know that yeah. that's a huge claim to make, but mm -hmm. I, I stand by it. No, I, th I think you're right. And I think most of the the ways out he found were usually complicated by some sort of moral dilemma, too, you know, so that it became much more engaging for us to participate in. And that was the thing as well. I mean, there were so many different layers to things, and you could read yeah. you could read it on a very much surface level, but there were a lot of other things going on throughout. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Um, so, just very quickly, then, what what targets and resolutions do you have for the forthcoming year? You know, somebody asked me that the other day, and I realized that. I should have had a resolution to make resolutions. <laughs> um, I don't know. I can't. I mean, I guess ride my bike more, but I already ride my bike pretty much. Maybe ride it more in the snow. It's been snowy these last three weeks here, and I haven't ridden my bike. Maybe I should become more of a snow, a snow rider um, to maintain my vehicles better because usually I just let them go to junk, and then I trade them in and get a new one and let it go to junk in two or three years. But I just got my Jeep back from the shop today, and – I'm trying to be, make a conscious effort to make a vehicle last this time instead of just using them up. Um, what else? I want to read outside my comfort zone more. Um, I love horror, but I can't only read horror. I need to read other genres. You know, I need to I need to figure out what makes like romance tick. I need to figure out what's the draw for literary fiction. Um, and I need to figure out science fiction. I don't know if you ever figure it out. I need to figure out. I need to figure it out enough to do it better anyways. And finally, who are some of the new writers, or at least new writers to you, uh, from 2014 that we should look out for in 2015? Man, used to, Adam Cesar was always my, my answer for what new writers are you excited about. But Adam's got so many books now, he's probably an old-timer. Best new writer I discovered this year? Ray Cluley, I think. His Water for Drowning really impressed me. I've got his new book on my Kindle right now. I'm excited to steal enough time to read it. But he has he has a he has a nice way of getting across the page and just a nice way of delivering the whole story package, I think. Um sometimes everything just comes together right and it seems that with his stuff, what I've read of it, it comes together right more often than not. Now, I know I said that the last question was the final question, but just one more question before we go. What books do you recommend that our listeners seek out who are looking to learn more about the craft of writing? You know, I think the, the books on writing, on craft, that I've got the most from, man, I would say Richard Hugo's The Triggering Town has been kind of like my Bible ever since, man, probably 96, 94, something like that. I've bought that book so many times, and I've given it away so many times. It, he's a poet writing on poetry, but it all applies to fiction, man. He, he has so much good advice. I can't even think where to start. A thin little book, you know, if it goes 80, 90 pages, I'd be surprised. But Richard Hugo, The Triggering Town, and of course Stephen King on writing, very, very helpful. Um... 
You know, I just read Steven Pinker's The Sense of Style, and that completely changed the way I mess around with sentences and think about how paragraphs and just prose works. It was really, I don't know, I feel like I'm a different writer since reading that book, and I'm, gonna, I'm about to read it again, too, just to become an even different writer. And, I mean, I guess that's three. I might, you know, Rick DeMoranis has a book, what is it, The Art of Writing Fiction, The Art of Fiction Writing, The Craft of Fiction Writing, I don't know, Rick DeMoranis, anyways, is the writer. I'm sure it's a findable book. That book, I've read that a couple of times. Stephen Bauer has a book on writing, B-A-U-E-R. It's pretty solid. Um, Janet Burroway's, any edition of her writing fiction textbook is immensely valuable. Always helpful. The way she just has everything categorized. Like if you're having a problem with point of view or, I don't know, how to include exposition or anything, it's just a go-to text. It's a resource. Um, yeah. And, I mean, of, of course, the big place that you get all your writing help is from reading other novels, from reading other fiction, you know? Reading it as a writer and losing yourself as a reader, of course. All right, well, thank you so much for taking some time out to talk with us today. As I say, I think it's been a really great podcast and we've got a lot of good stuff that our listeners can take away from it. Well, thank you. It's been really great talking to you all. You know, thanks for your time. I really appreciate it. And um, I think this is going to be a great episode of the podcast. So uh, all the best. And I'm sure we'll uh, we'll be in touch with you again soon. Great. So Great. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the This Is Horror podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please just take 30 seconds to go on over to iTunes, leave us a rating, and if you're feeling really generous, leave us a review. If you'd like to support the podcast and help us pay for the various associated costs, such as the hosting, then please do go to the This Is Horror shop and purchase one of our books. You can also shop through our affiliate links, which you'll find in the show notes. You'll be able to find the This Is Horror shop at thisishorror.co.uk and also at thisishorror.co.uk. In the right-hand navigation, you can sign up for our This Is Horror newsletter and keep up to date with everything. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.